Hello everybody, good afternoon, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. You know, of course we have a global audience. Most of you folks are, are in the US as are our panel today, um, but uh, I imagine we do have some of our European uh, uh, and Asian and even African folks in, in the room too. So welcome and I'm really excited to dig into the topic of interoperability today. Um, it's something which you know, can sometimes be seen with almost utopian optimism, something which can solve all of the biggest problems in healthcare. Uh, 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 and largely, I think that optimism is shared by many, but I imagine there are some risks involved and threats associated with it too. And so I'm really excited to be able to dig into this meaty topic with four real experts in the space today. Um, so I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and I'll, and I'll pick on you as, as the teacher did, looking around the room as I can see it, uh, and then we'll get stuck into the conversation. Um, so Don, perhaps I could ask you to go first. Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Don Woodlock. I'm a vice president of healthcare for a company called Inner Systems, uh, and we help customers, health systems, payers, life sciences with uh, electronic medical records and interoperability uh, generally. Fantastic, thanks Don. And Josh, over to you. Hi, I'm yeah, Josh Lamb. I am a technical lead for interoperability for a health system out of Pennsylvania. So uh, an implementer uh, implementing the, uh, the 21st century cures goals right now. Fantastic, thank you. Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Trainer. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Systems at Ashner Health in New Orleans and through the state of Louisiana. And I'm super happy to be here today. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Amy. And last but certainly not least, Jeff. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Crowd. I'm the Executive Vice President for Northwell Health in New York. It's one of the, it is the largest health system in New York. And you may have recalled that we administered the first uh, dose of the vaccine uh, uh, in America. Uh, and I also serve on the board of the New York eHealth Collaborative, which uh, oversees the State Health Information Network, and I chair the Public Health Council for the state of New York uh, for the past four governors. I didn't know that bit of vaccine trivia, but perhaps that will come up in, in a quiz at some point in the future. Um, so what I wanted to, to explore, first of all, as a panel is, you know, I, I guess, the reasons behind why people are getting excited about interoperability. What are the opportunities that conceivably it could enable, not just as an organization, but for us as a, an entire health system? Um, so Don, perhaps I could, I could pick on you to start there. What do you think the opportunities are here? Sure, I, I think that, um, I think people are excited about interoperability because we've come, you know, a good amount of way in the last five, seven years. Uh, in particular, I think a lot of caregivers, when they see a patient, they're able to find out more about that patient. You know, national networks like Commonwealth or Care Equality or Epic Care everywhere have really kind of opened up a broader view of the patient. It hasn't solved kind of every nook and cranny of the patient data, but you have more than you did a decade ago. Uh, so I think that's, that's, you know, underway. And I think there's just a couple you know, great opportunities going forward. The two I would highlight uh, are one is uh, real-time interoperability. So finding out about events as they happen or lack of events, a uh, gap in care, a patient didn't fill their medicine, one of your patients went into the ED over the weekend, you know, just having that kind of awareness of what's happening with your patient in, uh, in real time, I think is a real opportunity to take better care of a population and close gaps in care and that, that kind of thing. And I also think another opportunity is really kind of public health, population management, you know, survey, you know, syndromic surveillance, you know, identifying hot spots, those, those kinds of things for, you know, public health purposes, like we've all been, been through over the last year, year and a half, having, having a broader, you know, availability of information would have been really helpful in fighting this, uh, this pandemic for sure. Yeah, Donna, I agree. I, I would say the last year, uh, interoperability hasn't been more important, at least to us. We saw the reasons um, very openly when, you know, we had patients that tested positive for COVID in March of last year. 
And the only way to run that data or get that data was on paper um, from our state entity. And we did not have a way to interoperability, interoperably, I guess is the word, um, share that to where it's a usable format for our physicians and clinicians on the front line. And, and I think for me, um, that's in, made me more passionate about it. And like, how can we get, you know, we owe it to our patients, we owe it to our community to really be able to share information so that they get the best care when they show up at any facility, not just my facility or something, someone that's affiliated with me. Anywhere they go, they should be able to, all the clinicians should really have that ability to see that data. So um, that's to me the biggest opportunity. It's, you know, now is the time that we've got to talk about it more and really get organized, um, not just even in a state, but as a nation and as a, as a world to figure out how we can really, you know, take away the barriers and share data. And I, you know, I'd add that those of us who, you know, have been focused on health reform, uh, one of the most challenging aspects of this was to really improve that communication and the flow of information. And, and you know, an electronic medical record was the first step in a long process. And I would suggest that the, the promise of a, uh, it's still till pretty nascent. I mean, you know, we're, as Don and, and Amy mentioned, you know, it's, it's helped us. We haven't completely hardwired it into our clinical model. But it's going to be a foundational element, I think, of, of innovation in the future. And it's not only from an internal perspective or our business model and strategic objectives and improving the quality of care. I think from public policy and from government's perspective, this actually will be helping us to better inform and understand exactly what's happening, issues of health equity, uh, uh, that we would never be able to achieve if we did not have that that visualization of a patient journey. Yeah, I agree with all the prior points. Uh, I, I think that interoperable health data will really allow us to move away from the prevalence of fee-for-service uh, reimbursement models towards value-based care. A lot of the uh, hesitance from providers, at least based upon my reading, could be easily addressed through technology. So one of the powerful things with uh, a standardized interface is that we can really begin to have an economy of scale from the application developers and the, and the technology space so that we are not having to create a standard or, a cut or individualized integrations at each point of care. And we can really polish the implementations and have more quality and a more standardized approach, not only for the patient, but also for the provider and how they exchange that data. So allowing that data to really be summoned at the point of care would be a really powerful starting point, right? Where you, if you show up at a care setting in today's world, you're really providing all that information as if you never seen a doctor before. So through interoperability, if you could, uh, you know, press a few buttons, uh, we're not there yet, but eventually if you can, uh, in an easy way, have the data be shared, then that's going to be extremely powerful. Uh, it's going to just improve both the patient and the provider experience, you know, very greatly. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like, sorry, Carrie. I was just going to add, like what, what Joshua said, which is the standard is so important. Um, sharing data and it goes into a media file dump is not helpful to a doctor, a nurse, a dietitian, any of those folks. It has to be in a standardized format so that it's apples to apples and you know what you're looking for where. Um, and, and I feel like that's a big, you know, for the industry, that's a really important piece that we don't talk about a whole lot is, yeah, okay, great, I can share a PDF over or I can take one from someone else. But if that's not in a usable format for our clinicians, it, it's not really that helpful. So we've got to really focus on what are those standards, creating the standards and sticking to the standards, not customization when it comes to that data set sticking to the standards and saying, hey, we're going to send you this information in this format. We're going to accept it in that format. We're not going to go and make new values for uh, social determinants of health, or we're not going to go and change the depression screen that's already standard. We're going to give it to you in that format so that we can use that data moving forward. Otherwise, we're just sharing a bunch of text that nobody's going to look at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That seems to be a, a crucial foundation for the conversation. You know, standardization, it's easy to say and, and put on paper, but I imagine it's a lot more difficult to kind of to execute. So 
Um, I mean, Jeff, maybe I could point you for this one. What different kind of stakeholders need to be involved in that conversation if we're to approach some kind of system of standardization upon which the rest of this kind of you know, the opportunity could be built? It's the age old problem of data governance. I mean, even when within my own organization, I, you know, the nomenclature of how I identified a provider or their location or, 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 or the services, you know, so look, you know, I, I, you need these recognized bodies that establish standards. And we also have to get rid of the kind of the tribal issues on, on health quality. You know, everybody comes up with a different ranking and this, you know, it would be great. And I, you know, in New York state, we've been advocating, let's standardize all of the quality measures that go into what Josh referred to as the value-based contracting. Um, now the stakeholders, you know, kind of, it, this is not an IT problem, really. It, it, it is a policy. It requires the payers and providers of healthcare plus government being frankly, the largest payer in the United States. And, and you see CMS, I think, taking the lead in a lot of, uh, you know, through the Cures Act, you know, going back to high tech and, and, you know, the Office of the National Coordinator, basically starting that conversation and, and shaping it. So I think the leadership, at least that's been, been shown, I, I think it's very dangerous, as Amy pointed out, when you get these one-off models because the states have a different, this really needs to be a, a, a uniform set of federal rules that essentially apply throughout, much like I think, um, although I'm not completely familiar, how the European Union uh, kind of even created, you know, the, the standardized nomenclature that's, that's resonant in a lot of, a lot of uh, the medical records. So, so I, I think, you know, there's obviously, we all have a lot of, um, we have a, a lot of uh, stakeholders that are going to be advocating. You have uh, a big risk is, is, is large companies that have invested in, in their products that want to keep them proprietary and, and use proprietary algorithms. That's problem. That's just generally problematic and it's antithetical to the public policy objectives that we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah I, to I, your I, point, uh, or you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, is, yeah, so to Jeff's point, what we see now is uh, these conferences, connectathons, uh, these large events where since we're talking about a standard, we're talking about uh, commonly used technologies, we really can have all the various different stakeholders collaborate in the open because these are standards. So nothing is hidden. And the only thing that we are interoperating on are the things that are standardized or else you have no idea how to interface with elements that are kind of developed behind closed doors or in secret. So I think we'll continue to move away from these proprietary workflows into more of a standardized model. And these large entities like Jeff had mentioned, like CMS, will really have a lot of pull there, right? Where uh, just through their scale and their enforcement and development in uh, the ONC uh, for the technical standards uh, through the enforcement of these standards really gives everyone a platform to discuss these issues in a meaningful way. We're even beginning to see patient involvement, which is really exciting. We have a patient empowerment work group that's been recently formed and uh, you know, they're very energetic and excited to contribute towards their own healthcare. So yeah, uh, just really exciting. Um, we couldn't have any of that occur without standardization. So it's just very important. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just, I'm sorry, go ahead, Don. No, I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about what CMS is doing around pushing these, these uh, standards. I think it's a, it's a good role for, you know, CMS and regulation. I thought I'd never say a sentence like that, but, but, you know, nevertheless, it's a good interoperability standards. It's a really natural role to have, uh, you know, federal government agency kind of requiring it, pushing it. I really think it's gotten you know, off the ground, the adoption of kind of a new wave of standards with, uh, with fire, which I could explain if you'd like. Um, but, uh, but I just think that that's, that works really well. And some of the work groups like Da Vinci identifying use cases between providers and payers and just kind of buttoning it down at a national level really helps everybody kind of know how to coordinate. Vendors know, you know, what the doors to open up. People know how to 
how to work, work with each other around defined use cases. And that really helps all of us, I think, in this journey. I, I would also add, there's a paradox here because I'm, I'm not a big regulatory approach on a lot of things, but the paradox here is the regulation, you know, we can't view it as kind of as it's a compliance box and you're just checking it off. It's the regulatory framework that permits innovation. I think here by standardizing it. So we'll see, you know, with APIs, you know, we're going to see a lot of, of great ideas on how to use the data, how to empower individuals and, and how to produce insights that would otherwise be difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. So, so, so yes. it's, it's a, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jane. regulation in regu uh, regulation, enabling the innovation as opposed to, I, Something yeah, I think so. Although uh, you know, I'm 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 not a big regulator guy uh, personally, but you know, because sometimes regulation gets into micromanagement, and there's a difference here between m managing the behavior as opposed to creating the environment for for the clinical model to improve. I think. I think there's like with the 21st Century Cures Act in particular. Um, have a lot of feelings. I feel like the patient is deserving of their data um, as soon as I get it, right? So I'm the clinician, I get the data, you get the data. That's, that's us working together, the patient really being part of that care team and really helping, hey, did I miss something? Let me know, bring it to my attention. I think where it gets a little more dicey for me is around the APIs and the third parties. And, you know, I really feel very, very passionately um, that my role in, in this organization, as well as some of my coworkers, that we are really the, the data steward, right? We are the patient's data steward. We are there to protect that patient data, to make sure that it's not going to places that they don't realize. And I, I have a lot of concerns with what is the vetting process for the people that are part of this API for the second piece of Cures Act. I mean, how do we know what they're, are we checking to make sure, you know, the patient understands that they're requesting this data via third party, or are we vetting that they are not selling the patient data or moving forward or using it in a, in a way that the patient isn't understanding? And is that just done via a consent when you download an app, or is it really a, a process to me that might need my, a little bit more micromanagement to make sure that we are all collectively being that, that data steward um, for the patient's data? So what I had found, uh is that there is, a, there is guidance from CMS that where you can only block somebody from connect, connecting their third party app to your APIs if they present a security threat to your system. So largely, they gave the example at a uh, conference of the Nigerian Prince app. And you had a desperate uh, cancer patient who tried every app on the market. So they download the Nigerian Prince app and you're like, hey, this app is clearly bad. They're gonna steal your data. But if the patient wants to do that and you give them uh, the educational materials they need to give informed consent, it's, it, I mean, it's their data. Uh, I, I entirely agree that this is new and in a lot of ways it's very scary. But at the same time, I really, I hope at least maybe that's me being young and naive that I hope that this will become, uh, that that'll become more of the edge case and not the norm and that we'll see, uh, I mean, it takes a lot of work to develop these apps. And then if, uh, if you're on an app store, they'll take your app down if you're a bad app. So I don't see a lot of incentive to, uh, to really do anything with that data as of now, uh, just given that the development costs of creating an app, and then how is anybody gonna find your app if you can't get on any of the large app stores because you're a bad actor? But yeah, I like that's a very common fear. But um, but they put, took a pretty hard stance on blocking these apps from connecting to the APIs as well. So. Right. And then what is that data that I'm sharing? So if you're a fitness app and you grant consent to me, um, you know, I, Amy Trainer, say Ashner Health. You can, you know, third party system for my new fitness tracker. Get my information from Ashner Health. What are the data points that I'm sharing? And then am I aware that maybe you have more than you need? It, and, and that's kind of what the take we're looking at is we don't want to block, but we're only going to give you the minimum possible because we don't feel like it's our in the patient's best interest to share the whole kit and caboodle, right? Just because they possibly read something that they downloaded that was now asking for information from us. That's the, that's my big worry is people just don't know and 
we've got to figure out and make sure that those apps are safe, yes, from a security perspective, but also that the patient understands what they're consenting to and what is our role in that? Because they could probably do it on their device or whatever they're downloading the app on, but do we need to go and add another consent or, or do that double check to make sure that they really do understand what that looks like? And we're, we're just kind of in the beginning of developing processes for that. It's a really interesting one. I imagine over the years, I've probably you know, ticked the box and signed things having seen you know, two pages of prose and that's not really informed consent, right? I've scanned that and I've, I've ticked that box. And so it's, it, I guess it's around putting in you know, the safety measures with the patient's best interest at heart. But part of that inevitably will be, you know, as per GDPR in Europe, you are not only responsible for your stewardship of the data, but for that of third parties and third parties, third parties. So it's really you know, a networking, a network thing. And you have to be responsible for the lowest common denominator ultimately. And so what different processes could organizations put in place to look to ensure the stewardship, not just in their own organization, but across the network that, that their data is shared with as well? Um, that's an open question for, for the panel. Well, I'll, I'll just to quickly adopt the other side of that, because that's sort of everyone's gut instinct is how do we protect this data? But if you think of this from the innovator's perspective, they need to connect with thousands of different health systems. There's 10,000 different health system endpoints in the US alone. There's over 300 health insurance payers. So if, if, if I'm an application developer and I want to make an amazing app, it's not going to be valuable unless that app could potentially be in any person's pocket. So if the burden of having to prove myself and jump over hurdles for uh, 10,300 different you know, uh, health systems and payers, that could be really extreme. So uh, I, we do want to protect the patient's data and do this in a responsible way. But also, because it's the standardized interface, the standardized approach, you don't have a lot of freedom and flexibility to, uh, to raise barriers that others aren't going to be raising. So uh, yeah, so it, it makes it tricky there, right? Uh, yeah, we, we want to enable interoperability, but also we don't want it to become a dangerous thing. We, like, we, don't, we don't want to become like the Terminator, like, uh, you know, like the, the countdown till the AI goes live. And, but, but yeah, uh, yeah, I share all those concerns, but at talking with these application developers, it's, yeah, hearing their stories, uh, they, like, they like a consistent way to connect. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I do think the thread that, that Josh is on and, and um, Jeff also mentioned this, is that standards do create a level of innovation that can occur. You know, for every developer to have to figure out how to hook up to all these different backend systems and get data out. The fact that regulations sort of require backend systems uh, open up and that there's a standard by which you can kind of uh, understand the information that comes out of these systems enables, you know, a lot of good apps, let's say, that'll help a patient better take care of themselves or be engaged in their care or a physician have a better experience using you know, using the, the patient's data. So I do think that there's certainly, certainly a positive way to, uh, to look at it. Uh, back to Amy's point though, I think, that's, I think this is the greatest kind of risk in this area is really to have a level of control, visibility, understanding of the data sharing that's going on. And, you know, I would think a key additional piece in addition to just good education as the patient you know, uh, specifies their initial preferences or their initial authorization on an app is ongoing transparency. You know, here's the data that was shared. It was shared last week with so-and-so, or your data just went out to this pharma company in a de-identified way for this particular study, or, you know, those kinds of transparency and awareness uh, beyond the original event, I think would be a nice you know, a, I know it's complicated, but kind of a nice addition to the picture so patients really get a much better understanding of what's happening with their, with their data because they, they really do have a right to know. Yeah, so here, here you're going to go, and this is one of the pendulum swings, okay? If, if you were speaking to four compliance officers from our respective organizations, you'd have a completely different discussion on this particular topic. So I've spent a lifetime liberating data. 
liberating it from my own organization and now liberating it in, on behalf of patients. And, you know, the bad players, the, the amount of times my organization's network is attempted to be penetrated, some of the successful ones, you know, we're, we're very nervous. And I think we're going to move in a very cautious way. The, that 10,000 systems that Josh basically, or touch points that Josh described, is really going to be challenging. And you have 10,000 developers that are going to look to monetize this data for the benefit of patients. So, you know, it's beyond getting that good housekeeping seal of approval on the apps we're connecting. You need a third party that's going to minimize our um, legal exposure if we inadvertently think that, you know, the, the, the patient asks us to do it, we give it to a, you know, it becomes, you know, we're in the middle of the transaction. There's going to be litigation for anybody that's in that transaction of that data stream. And, but Don's point is, you know, who has the affirmative responsibility to make sure and inform somebody every time? It's like your credit report. You know, if you signed up for the credit report, you're, you get a text when somebody does a soft inquiry or a hard inquiry. We're going to have to routinize that. And that, that in itself is probably going to be a business that we're all going to subscribe to, right? I, I need somebody that's going to manage that because I'm trying to take care of patients. And I, I'll, you know, but that'll spawn yet another industry, I suspect. I think that the key phrase there, Jeff, at least for me, was liberating data on behalf of patients. And it's that balancing act that, that we have to strike. You know, to what extent can we do that, which is fair and reasonable and has informed consent, but also enables us to, to share data in a way which can provide better solutions ultimately. But, but one of the challenges I, I would imagine that there are lots of oh. organizations and companies that have you know, built business models and monetizing patient data, which is owned within their moat to an extent. And so how do we overcome that competitive hurdle? Well, you know, let me, before I get to the competitive hurdle, let me just point out this. I think we're going to, the, the fear I have, it, and I've have firsthand experience from some of the experiences we've done is we're overwhelming individuals with data and and to what end all right and, and so you know everybody has a right to it so I, I it's absolute it's not my data i'm holding it on your behalf i'm making it available where you direct it and we you know then you know well a payer is saying to us i have the right if as a as a function of insurance if i'm going to provide you uh, i want contemporaneous access to your data so you're going to have you're going to have that discussion, or I will incent you if I have contemporaneous access to your data, get a 10% discount on your insurance. You know, there there is going to be a lot of these consequences of the of making this more um, uh, viscous, or uh, you know, that allows it to flow, because uh, we're removing that friction uh, and 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 the barriers here. So I think that that in and of itself is going to be a major issue. And then we're going to have to deal with the downside of by transporting your data, you know, at, at some level, you're with Oxner, you're with Northwell, you're with New York Presbyterian, you kind of stay within the system of care. The fear here is also you will end up fragmenting your care more by taking it and sending it to multiple providers. Um, because it's easy, second opinion, and nobody's quarterbacking the data, and it gets it becomes um, less relationship based, more transactional, uh, and that that is also another um, possible uh, outcome. I'm not saying it's negative or positive, but it's it's something we're going to be challenged to do. So I think there's a, there's two different aspects of this. There's the uh, a API sending data to an app for a consumer, but then there's an API sending data to another HIPAA covered entity so that they can operationalize that data. So there's going to be drastically different approaches taken depending on these two different circumstances. And the liability, at least from my understanding as a non-lawyer, is much greater for an exchange between one API to a HIPAA covered entity that they go and in turn use that data to provision care. So uh, I think that we can find that you'll be a little bit more lenient for the data that's going to a personal device so that a consumer can just look at that data and use that data however they wish. 
but at the point that you're going to ingest data as a HIPAA covered entity to provision care, that's when you'll want to be a lot more strict and stringent and have agreements in place with the entity that is sending data. You'll want to understand how they identity proof that person, to, uh, how they, uh, uh, we have what processes they have in place, what's the security of their system, uh, but you won't necessarily need to have all of those things in place for just sending data to like Apple Health or something like that. And the other downside here is, you know, that you're going to have a segment of our society that is going, you know, that is going to take exception to what I, some people would suggest are paternalistic comments. You know, I'm here to protect you, so trust me. You know, we're going we're gonna to have to deal uh, with, you know, the whole issues of privacy. We're seeing it now with vaccine and vaccine passports about the pros and cons of, of doing that. And it's, uh, it, it, you know, and the whole COVID experience uh, underscored the importance of interoperability uh, and early warning systems that, that, uh, that, you know, still I'm having trouble in the state getting the data. But we'll, we'll get into public health maybe later. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It seems like at the moment, um, as a result of, of COVID, it has underscored the, the, the need for interoperability, among other things. And it's provided an environment that has enabled greater innovation and speed. But you know, as the, theoretically return to a, a sense of new normal, is there a risk that that environment snaps back and we return to a status quo and don't leverage the you know the silver lining of the pandemic and what is is enabled from an innovation perspective i mean i hope not i would say that this is our time you know i i feel like that's something i've been saying for the last six months at least our state um health entities you know we don't have a better time to really come together and fix it as of now to me it is very sad that when you your only official proof of vaccination is a paper card that is now being sold out there, uh, I mean, we shouldn't be there. Um, we are smarter and better and more advanced than that. But we have all of these barriers that we're, we're not really taking down fast enough to kind of move that forward. Um, no one should have a problem with your, your vaccination data is already, your other vaccination data is shared with your state already. Is the state sending it to the federal government? Sometimes, maybe not. Who are they sending it to? I mean, these are questions that I feel like if the people that work together like we are here today who live this every single day could talk on a more regular basis and, and really explain like, guys, like, this is not a technical limitation. It's really that we're just not organized and we need to be more organized, move things up different levels. I don't want to build interfaces to every agency in the, in the state, in the country, in the world. That is a pain for me. I want to send it to a person that I know is trusted and then they share it with the folks that are above them. And that is not happening. Um, not consistently. It was like a, a band-aid that was pulled off during COVID. It is still that way for vaccinations. Um, we've got to do something. I, I, I am very excited to hear more people talking about interoperability um, around, you know, originally we we're talking about claims data. Of course, we can talk about claims data, but like when you're talking about the now, the thing we need now is really around, you know, public health. Um, how do we help? How do we use public health as the, the thing to move us forward and, and get us to that next level? And then the other pieces kind of fall into place. But this one, we've got a lot of motivation behind it. We just need to capitalize on it. Yeah, I, unfortunately, we do have an ability to forget things quickly and <laughs> snap snap back but i'm optimistic you know covid was just such a and still is kind of a hard worldwide battle and there was just such such an obvious kind of connection to how public health could have been better with a connected interoperable health system that i i think we'll we'll remember this and drive improvements so we can have kind of a next generation public health uh, approach. It just just makes so much sense. I mean, pulling out the, you know, the old ways of doing things, calling all the hospitals in New York every day. How many patients do you have there? And how many are in your ICU? How many have COVID? And hanging up the phone, writing it down, calling the next hospital. I mean, it's just, uh, it was embarrassing display of lack of interoperability. And hopefully we can, you know, get through this and re rewire our health system. 
Yeah, and, and Jamie, I would just say that uh, this morning, right before this, I, I was on a call with the energy, the staff of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, in the House, and uh, I have to tell you that there is no way this is not top of mind, and they are going to be, uh, they recognize the, the, uh, how it exposed the inherent weakness of our public health infrastructure, and they recognize that data and information was at the heart of one of the major uh, fault lines. And they're, they're, they're absolutely determined to do something about that. And so I, I, I don't think we're going to go back. And I think for those of us in the business of liberating that data, be it an all claims database, this is our time to advocate for what we, what will Good data presented in a neutral way will drive good policy, and and that's that's what I think our time has come, is is to liberate that information for all the good reasons we discussed. Yeah. So uh, to one point that Amy made and everyone else sort of alluded to is how how do we trust uh, who we're connecting to, right? Uh, if you're if you're talking with others. You don't want to make those uh, 10,000 different integrations. So there, there are some good works uh, that are occurring now in, uh, in terms of trust frameworks, where there would be a trusted entity that would have a repository of trusted applications and trusted endpoints so that you know that if I call out to this trust framework, I'll get back information that I can rely upon and operationalize to provision care. So uh, in terms of like a vaccine uh, certification, there's many different entities who could credential that you had received the vaccine. Per perhaps you might look at uh, your claims data and say, oh, well, you had two claims for uh, vaccine administration, therefore you're vaccinated. Now there's several other entities that do that as well. Every state has their own uh, immune information system. They all do not talk in the same exact way. So uh, we'll have to have a standardized way and a way for everyone to go and call out and trust so that we know that we're getting data in a way that we can understand and we can rely upon to, uh, you know, sort of make those decisions. So I think that there's a lot of potential and a need for, uh, for trust frameworks to occur uh, so that we can move beyond the, hey, here's my data on my, on my iPhone, isn't that cool, but I can't really do anything with it, to the point of where we're actually operationalizing this data. So I have, a, I have a lot of excitement in terms of the trust frameworks and how they're going to help this uh, you know, move forward in a very meaningful way. So, so, so if, if, we, if we zoom out, maybe, maybe Don, I could, I could go to you with this one. So if we had to zoom out and look forward to a year or two, what would your, your hopes be for what interoperability would achieve and, and would enable within, within the broader healthcare system? Well, I think, um, uh, I think, like I mentioned earlier, I, I think real time interoperability, you know, so a health system can take care of their patients, a, patient, a payer can take care of their membership, I can identify gaps in care, can swoop in and help the patient at times of, of, uh, of need and really manage a population, whether it's value based uh, care scenarios, whether it's public health uh, scenarios, you know, treat, treating patients as a uh, as a group and really managing and and applying the resources where they're needed uh, where they're needed most um, and I do I, I do think that we are kind of building that momentum we're building standards we're getting the technical infrastructure in place to really you know take it take it to that next level but I'd love to you know get get beyond the kind of pull scenario where you're pulling pulling that record for that common view to more of the kind of manage and lead and take care of a population uh, scenario. I think that would be, that would be very beneficial to get done in the next couple of years. So kind of enabling that movement of, of healthcare to be more upstream. So keeping people out of hospital seems sure. to be a kind of an underlying thread here. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, I think gap gaps in care is a good way to, Good way to think about it. You're you're a high risk diabetic. You're supposed to be doing your A1Cs, your your foot exams. You know th those those kinds of things. Are they happening? Are you picking up your meds? Are you having the right visits? Are are you know are things going off the rails? Where some level of care management or intervention or or broader family awareness for 
um, you know, for, for folks would be, would be helpful to keeping the patient yeah. healthy. Well, and, and also what, what you're really talking about is as we move upstream and downstream of the provider experience and go into tracing the social determinants, you know, the ability to move this data on behalf of the patients is critical to a lot of organizations that don't have the infrastructure or the capability or the depth. A lot of these are not-for-profit social service organizations that are going to be challenged, that will benefit from the data, critical to their role, and we're going to have to figure out how to bring them uh, and connect them and, and who's going to pay for that and who's going to support that because it's going to be critical. That'll probably be the subject of a lot of innovation at state level, uh, particularly on the Medicaid programs, and, and you'll see some CMMI activities there. But remember, we're talking, you know, if you come back to how we're going to save money, so we've got a $3.8 trillion spend in the country, but that's only on about 80% uh, of that cost is on 20% of the people. And we got 50% of the population that we spend three cents of, the, of that dollar on. So, you know, the, the promise of, of interoperability are on those most complex, chronically ill, multiple interactions. And, and you know, we don't have to boil the whole ocean to solve for this. And, 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 and it's, it is going to need some focusing here because, and, and unfortunately, you know, it might, it might be that 50% that we spend the three cents on that are really into their health and stay healthy that want to use all this activity. We got to figure out it's that other 20% uh, how to get them engaged to, to use all these tools and their providers and net networks. So Jeff, uh, you kind of touched on the thing that I'm most passionate about. Now this is, Jamie mentioned a one year time frame. This will probably take much longer, but to really have a patient centered uh, set of data so I've heard estimates that even if you took all the clinical and claims data, uh, but if, if you were to supplement that with wellness data, so how much are you sleeping? What's your nutrition like? Uh, yeah, uh, like, you know, what exercise routines are you following? What's, what's your heart rate throughout the day? So if you were really to have patient owned wellness data, in addition to all of the patient owning all of their uh, care data and have that data be able to flow around with that patient to the point of care, well, wherever they may be. So if they, even if they go to a state-based clinic that has no resources, like you mentioned, could that patient direct that data or could the provider, because uh, let's just admit it that not all patients are gonna engage with this data or have access to electronic devices. So it has to be something that can be administered even without a lot of engagement from the patient. But uh, yeah, having that data available and centered on the patient, I think it will be very powerful for a building up a health equity, right? Where my uh, activities today are really building out a trust fund of wellness for the future and for me to kind of feel better and healthier and have uh, less interactions with the healthcare system in the future. So more of a long game, but I think it's gonna be very powerful. Oh, I mean, Josh, if, if you kind of blue sky what's possible, think about social determinant, what you eat is so critical. Now, how can I go, I go shop at ShopRite, same supermarket I use, I get a, I, everything has scanned. What if I could take the data from my weekly shopping in my grocery store and have that uploaded as well, and you could analyze the fat content, my calories, the sugar consumption. I mean, you could start thinking about how we connect those pieces of our lives to, to address the issue here. That, you know, that's another company we could start up. That's another business. But, you know, now we're going to have to compel ShopRite to give that to third parties. You know, we're going to be in a little tricky place. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a hand in the fridge. That'll slap you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, every time you take something out, it scans it. You know what you're eating. You know, I, I don't know. It's kind of, it's possible. It's definitely possible. They might do it already. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, <that's> <laughs> but, well, What's exciting, I suppose, is that, that you can you can ask those questions and you can realistically shoot for the moon, um, which, which is fantastic. A um, couple of minutes to go, guys, and this has been this has been a fa fantastic panel. So so thank you. I, I feel like we could we could keep talking all day, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time. But I'd love to just ask you. You know, you're all, you're all evangelists for this, and I think a big part of this is is the advocation of interoperability. So I'd love for your kind of final thoughts, key takeaways, or key messages 
for for the audience but before we wrap up if that's okay um i'll start with you don and, and, and perhaps make yeah sure up. i think i guess key message wise i'm quite quite optimistic about interoperability i think we've done a lot you know in terms of the last five years with standards with regulation with technology opening up systems those those kinds of things and i think that um you know the pandemic has really you know identified some areas where we could really take it to the next level you know from a population management public health point of view enabling innovation point of view and i think we just need to kind of seize this moment where there's motivation a good foundation a good you know cooperative working relationship across the industry to sort of move move the ball down the field and i'm quite optimistic we will fantastic uh, and josh yeah, I would like everyone to think of this as more of an opportunity and less as a threat. I, I realize that it's scary. There's a lot of new things. We have a, we want to protect the patient, right? The, uh, this, there's a lot of potential for harm here, but I think the potential for good is much greater. And if we think of these uh, sort of blue sky ideas, we can get there. It's largely not a technology problem. The technology behind all this is pretty trivial, to be honest. It's more of a, uh, it's a, it's a person problem. It's a, a status quo issue. It's a, uh, you know, competing interest in how do we monetize this type of issue. So if we can sort of reframe how we think of this from checking that compliance box to how do we, how do we leverage this to create value, improve care outcomes, and to just be better people, right? Uh, maybe payers can try and fix, uh, payers all have a great reputation all the time. Let's just be honest about that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for pairs in particular to sort of don the white hat as it were, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, just reframe it from a threat to an opportunity, be a little bit optimistic about it. Fantastic. Thanks, Josh. Uh, and Amy, what are your I guess key, key takeaways? Well, I, I agree with what these guys said. Um, keep moving it forward. Uh, we've got to really focus on this. Now's the time. I would say it's like a movement. Um, we, I don't want it to stop. I think we've got to continue to be more transparent. Transparency in sharing is now, it's not something that's in the future. We've got to all get okay with it and understand it, find those trusted partners, really part of those trusted networks like Joshua said. Um, really focus on like, how can we really enable the patient to continue to be part of the care team? It is their data, it is their information. We've got to continue to push forward with ways that we can interact with them and share data with them that will help their health. And, and be able to make a healthy life for, for them moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, and Jeff? Yeah, so interoperability in and of itself is not the goal. It's, it's rather the competency that I think we have to attain in order to get greater care coordination, enhanced engagement with patients, satisfaction, uh, improved operational efficiency, and to achieve public health and strategic objectiveness. It is, it is the foundational element that allows us to act as a healthcare system of care. Yeah, fantastic, so fa fantastic final, final messages there. So um, uh, time, for, time for thanks. Thanks to, to everyone in the audience for, for tuning in and being so engaged and, and dropping us uh, lots of questions. Uh, thanks to the, the team at InterSystems for, for sponsoring uh, and partnering with us on this and to Don, Josh, Amy, Jeff, Thanks, thanks to you for you know your time and insights today. It's been, it's been a privilege, uh, and we'll see you again soon. Very good, thank you.